it actually is really, really exciting to be part of energy and to have a new fundamental play with energy. And nuclear has always been that like sort of dark horse. It's always been this like, what if we could just make energy way cheaper? Because the economics of it are crazy, right? Like people don't realize that the economics are insane. A dollar of uranium turns into like $48,000 of electricity. Like the, the gap there is enormous. And so it's just this dark horse that's always kind of on the on the horizon, but it just has the wrong market until Valor. Like all the other companies trying to pursue that, I just think they have the wrong market. Um, electricity is, is a terrible product at the end of the day. So I think the thing that's really exciting is like, we get to actually ride that dark horse into the city, um, but we're gonna ride it on the back of hydrocarbons, not electricity. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Isaiah here with me. Uh, I thought a great place to start is just let's go to right to your website. You guys obviously put this on your website because this speaks to who you are and what you guys are building. On your website, the first thing people see is it says engineers wanted. We're building a company by solving one of the hardest problems in physics using a historically unpopular fuel within a very short timeline. Not to mention tackling complex manufacturing and creating an unproven commodities market along the way. The odds are against us, but we wouldn't have it any other way. What are you doing? <laughs> that sounds like a death mission. What are you doing and why is this so important? Yeah, I mean, some of the best missions in the world have been death missions. So um, no, I think we're going to win though. Uh, it, it's definitely a hard challenge, but I think we're going to win. So what we're doing uh, is going to sound pretty counterintuitive, but we are creating jet fuel and other hydrocarbons and we're creating them out of thin air. So this is this is strange, but all of the ingredients for jet fuel and diesel and gasoline and methane and all the hydrocarbons um, are already in the air, right? So the ingredients are hydrogen and carbon. That's what makes up a hydrocarbon. And um, you can get the carbon from CO2 in the air. You can get the hydrogen from water. And so, yeah, we are literally making jet fuel out of thin air. Um, in order to do that, you, you need a, an energy source, though, because uh, th this is, a, you know, hydrocarbon is an energetic molecule in the sense that because there's oxygen throughout the atmosphere and there's hydrogen, you have a, like a high potential energy state. And uh, so in order to get back to a hydrocarbon, you need a lot of energy from somewhere. And for us, that energy source is nuclear fission. So uh, that's where the unpopular fuel source comes from. It's, it's, all, it's both like an unpopular source, which is nuclear, and then also an unpopular product, which is jet fuel. Um, but uh, we love that matchup. It's very, very counterintuitive, very contrarian. And at the end of the day, I think it'll make us all trillionaires. So yeah, we're, we're happy with it. Let's go through first taking the air in, walk through that process specifically. Like, do you just have a big fan that like, rather than blow out is like sucking in uh, a bunch yeah. of air and going into like a product that you built or, or how does it work? Yeah, so uh, carbon capture, there's a bunch of different ways to do it. We'll probably use a calcium based. So uh, basically how this works is that calcium will um, sort of bond to the CO2 in the air and um, it, you know, it'll, form another compound and then you can go cook that compound or you can dissolve it in a solution and you get the CO2 released out. And so there's a cycle, but yeah, the short answer is there's a fan, the fan, you know, moves air across a substrate and then you, you know, you cook that the CO2 back out, absorbs it, you cook it back out in some way. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so exactly right. Big fans. Now, as you're doing that, at what point does the fuel or the energy source get introduced to the process? Yeah, so it doesn't take too much energy to capture carbon. Actually, uh, it's, it it does take energy, but not not an enormous amount. Um, the I, I guess like the energy difference between bonding the CO two with the substrate and then releasing it back out is not enormous. Um, it does take energy to run the fans, but there's like this trade off of like how big is your plant versus how fast are the fans running, and so you can choose to like spend more in fans or spend more in energy. Uh, that part is not the super energetic part. The thing that's like takes a lot of energy is creating hydrogen. Um, really what we do is we create hydrogen. So I, I can kind of tell you the backstory in a little bit on how we got here, but um, the most important thing we do is we make hydrogen. Once you have hydrogen, um, it's nice, like hydrogen is expensive. You could theoretically sell it for a lot, but it's like impossible to transport. So where this really becomes a big scalable business is bonding it with CO2 where we get a, a hydrocarbon. Uh, but the energy usage, you know, the reason we need scaled nuclear is is creating that hydrogen. What is the use when you say jet fuel? Is it literally just for jets or are there other uses for the end byproduct? Yeah, I mean, 
listen, like hydrocarbons are the world literally runs on them. Um, and that's, that's not just true right now. It's going to stay true. And I think it's going to become more true. Like e even as we are electrifying a lot of different things, um, I'm all for electrification of certain things. I own a Tesla, but, um, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense for driving around in LA traffic, the instant acceleration, the fact I can plug it in, don't have to go to the gas station. These things are nice, but man, like the whole world runs on hydrocarbons, um, jets, like aircraft are never going to run on lithium ion. It's just not going to happen. Um, it's possible that some other battery tech will come up that suddenly allows us to have like intercontinental airliners without hydrocarbons. But on the flip side, it's like they already work so well. They're they're so power dense. Um, and uh, yeah, so so they're already awesome. Um, but yeah, as far as like end use cases, you know, burning burning methane is how most of the world produces electricity. Uh, well, so either either methane or coal. I think it's about 40 percent of. Uh, of electricity in the U S is generated by burning methane, natural gas and turbines. And I think it's 30% globally. Uh, and then globally, like the rest of that's coal. So like hydrocarbons are how we get energy today. Uh, and it's just because they're so transportable that like you can, you can stick them in a bucket. Uh, that's, that's something that's just really misunderstood and not appreciated is that you can carry energy in a bucket. You can pour this liquid in there, and now you can move, me, you know, megawatts of power around, um, and that's that's huge. So, in the announcement of the business, you had this tweet, and you said, "All of our greatest ambitions, interplanetary life, artificial intelligence, robotics, and biotech, need energy that is orders of magnitude cheaper and more abundant than we have now." In 1970, we stopped our centuries-long march of making energy cheaper. Why did the progress stop? Yeah, you know, there's two reasons, and it, it's kind of hard to separate these things and understand the the real core reason. I think there probably is one core reason, but it might have been a confluence of events. The two basic reasons are, one, we started to reach a limit on how efficient it actually is to drill, transport, and refine oil. And then the other reason is we started to kind of have these like political fears about oil. Um, and that, that includes like this concept of peak oil, which people talk about for a long time. It also includes like the environmental movement. So we both kind of reached a max efficiency on literally just like the machinery and the tooling and the labor that goes to like drill and refine oil. And then also there's like these political headwinds that arose at the same time. So those two things, um, yeah, and the geopolitical as well. So it's political and geopolitical, meaning like who owns the oil, where does it come from? And then also resistance to, to developing it domestically. Those two things, I think, combined to set us back as far as the what's called the Adams curve, uh, which is our you know cost and consumption of energy um, diverging over time. When the progress goes stagnant, how hard is it to restart? Do you need one company? Do you need 10 companies? Do you need five governments like like how much you know kind of um re-energizing of that momentum is needed to really kind of get going again yeah so that's such a great great question um the the core answer to that question is actually the reason that it took me as long as it did to start this company uh i've been thinking about this since i dropped out of high school really since i was 17 and um it took me a long time to realized that there was a single lever that I could pull that I think could actually restart this thing. Um, but I do genuinely believe that, you know, single companies uh, throughout history have been able to create massive, massive movements and swings and really reshape entire industries, governments, all, all sorts of things. But they start in one place. SpaceX is the most recent example of this. It's like if we were sitting here in like 2001 and it was like, is can we really restart space travel? Like, is that can one company really do that? Is Elon really that guy? It, you you would have had some skepticism in you know in, in the early two thousands that you know it's like listen man like space launch it's so many different vendors it's so many different contractors there's different governments involved there's regulatory agencies you know who's going to make the rocket engines who's going to weld up you know the, the pressure tanks and um, but then it turns out that like one company with a really, really clear and focused mission, pushing you know, for, for a decade in the same direction with passion can actually change a ton. A lot can change really quickly. And once you have that like one spike, 
then a lot of other things in the periphery get changed, like regulations shift a little bit and vendors appear where there weren't vendors before, labor forces grow, these, these sorts of things. So um, I think that's a similar position to where we're sitting right now, which is like, yeah, there's a lot that needs to change to, uh, to make energy cheaper. But I think we have found that spike in energy and it comes down to mating you know, an old established industry, which is hydrocarbons, with a much, much cheaper source of energy, which is nuclear. And I think when those things come together, it's a really beautiful marriage. What in that process uh, are the things that you feel most confident you can figure out and, and kind of get going? And then what are the things that seem, even for you who's in this day-to-day, has studied it, is betting your time, energy, uh, and reputation on this, uh, seem the least likely to actually be successful or, or to kind of get the breakthrough? Yeah. Um, counterintuitively, nuclear is the most straightforward part of this. Um, we know how to make nuclear reactors. We've made many, many nuclear reactors, both in the United States and in other countries of all kinds and forms with you know hundreds of thousands of hours of operation and recording data and things going right and things going wrong and iterating. We have not done that as much recently, but we have done it in the past to a, to a really large degree. Uh, my my great grandfather was at Oak Ridge, uh, which is where they developed a lot of the advanced you know nuclear prototypes they could talk about today. And this was like the '60s and '70s. So yeah, I would say the like the nuclear side, it's much more of a of a question of like, can you get this thing to a higher technology readiness level where where it's ready to manufacture, and then there's a market waiting for it on the other side. Um, and then you know on on the far into the spectrum, like making jet fuel, that's also pretty well proven. Like we, we, we make synthetic fuels in a variety of ways today. Um, so I, I guess if I had to look at the whole stack and say like, what am I least sure about right now? It's probably cheaply producing hydrogen, which kind of sits in the middle. So you have like nuclear heat and then you have hydrogen production and then you have making hydrocarbons. And I would say making hydrogen is probably that risk area right now. So that's actually why we're currently testing that in the lab. And how much of this can you test on a small scale and kind of like get individual components and say, yep, this looks good. This looks good. Like, let's go build the big thing yeah. versus nah, man, we just got to we, we got to build the full thing and, you know, yeah. hit the green button, turn it on, make sure that it works. Yeah. No, all of it. Um, we like if there's a spectrum of like doing the giant thing in 10 years versus taking small steps and building whatever we can and scaling up, I'm like far, far on this end where we're. We, we want to make the smallest possible thing. We want it completely to work from end to end. And then we want to learn from that. And then we want to take the next step and make it a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a practice maximalist. Like theory is great. And uh, personally, like I have a lot of intellectual curiosity about theory. Uh, and it's, it's really fun to debate with people and write papers. But industries move forward on practice and heuristics, not on like sort of paper research. Like if you kind of look into the the development of a lot of like really, really advanced industries where they're doing crazy stuff, it really happens through practice and heuristics. Like the, like the jet engine is a great example of this. Like we didn't really understand the thermodynamics of jet engines until they were already being used in commercial operations for like 30 years. That, that's That's a pretty underrated thing that people don't realize. Like we didn't really understand what was happening in a jet engine until 30 years after people were flying around in them. Um, and that's because people were experimenting, right? They, they had a lab and they're like, well, what if we put the fuel at this temperature? Can we add like a bunch more thermal couples to this hot section and like figure out the temperature gradients that way? Do we really have to know the theory behind that? Um, now there are, you know, there, there's usefulness to, to modeling and prediction. There's a lot of things that you have to do in that direction for safety, but you just, you have to practice it. You have to actually do it. Why is the government not pushing so much of this. Like when we hear certain technologies, as you describe multiple times, unpopular, I may use the word controversial, even to some degree, uh, with some of the things that you guys are going to be working on here. Um, yeah. Is the government scared? Is the government bought by, you know, old world kind of non-innovative companies and, and executives? Like what's going on and, and why is the government not kind of more uh, persistent in seeing this happen? Yeah, um, I, I think. There, I think there are three phases. There was one phase, you know, it's sort of post-war, you know, post-World War II era, 
where the government was on its A game. Like we were going to the moon. Uh, we had just done the Manhattan Project. We were setting up the national labs. Uh, it was it was the get shit done era of sort of the federal bureaucracy. And um, that really was a product of just a lot of eternal spirit. Like we just had government spirit, you know? Uh, like, yes, this we are capable of going to the moon. And it's this like top down, like Congress funded way of getting science and industry done. But that that takes like so much cultural virtue, if that makes sense. Um, it takes everybody having like a highly patriotic sense of the mission. And uh, it's somewhere along that line, like we kind of lost that like group group society, like American like spirit of, of like doing things collectively. Um, and so like that's one function of like why why we are not able to move like with incredible speed anymore. As far as like, is it bought by people? There was definitely a time in which, um, you know, a lot of like our regulators were bought by various interests that didn't want to have nuclear happen. Oil and gas is a really obvious one. You can go and you can go and trace all that down where, where oil and gas basically stopped uh, nuclear development from happening. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think that actually oil and gas companies now um, are actively looking for ways to be part of the next generation of energy production. Um, and now we're kind of in that mode where the government might not actually necessarily know what's fastest and what's best, right? They, they might not actually have a clear picture of what is the best and fastest way to move an industry forward. And that's where it falls on our shoulders. Like, you know, regulators are default risk averse. They want things to not blow up. That's, that's great. And entrepreneurs have to go out and prove to them, this is the right way to do it. What has been the response uh, so far from some of these industry players? Are they uh, trying to help you? Are they uh, kind of, hey, cute idea, kid, you know, let's see you later. Um, yeah. what, what has been kind of some of those conversations or, or at least things you're aware of so at this moment? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, uh, you know, I am a kid, you know, I'm 24 and uh, it is a cute idea. So, you know, if, if anyone's saying that right now, like I don't fault them, um, I, I think, uh you know, I have a lot to prove and that's fine. But I would say the reaction has been generally positive. I've, I've certainly had a lot of those conversations where it's like, yeah, okay, like good luck actually getting this thing across the line. It costs my company $3 billion to make this one over here. Um, and you're going to do it with like a couple hundred million? Sure, kid. Like, you know, um, I certainly have gotten a little bit of that. I would say overwhelmingly though, the writing is on the wall with uh, with nuclear that people are starting to understand like the incentives that have brought us to where we are in nuclear. And that those things have have caused caused pretty big like price distortions, and somebody coming up with the right model to break through that actually is quite compelling. Um, I would say the vast majority of people I've talked to in the existing industry, when I kind of lay out the you know our plan and how it addresses it, it, you know addresses like the incentive problems in the market, are like, wait a minute, that could actually work, and I want to be part of that. So that's been the overwhelming uh, impression so far. And. What are the skill sets you need to build this? Like you obviously have an understanding of some yeah. of the science. You, you, you've formulated this after thinking about it for a long time. Um, you're not going to do it alone though. So like what, what no. are the skill sets that, that are necessary? Great question. Let's make this the header clip. Uh, let's put this all over X. Uh, <laughs> thank you for giving me the platform. Um, look, man, like we need extremely, extremely cracked people to work on this. And um and it, it's a it's a few different skill sets, but like the most important thing just at the outset is like people need to be crazy fast, crazy dedicated, be willing to to like take risks and try things that haven't been done before, and mostly just move very very fast. That's like the it's almost a personality trait that I'm looking for initially with that. But then particular skill sets are like thermo hydraulics people, um, anyone who's worked with pressure vessels and welding at pressure vessels to do the right thing at the right time. Uh, nuclear physics, of course, we need people to be doing, you know, core modeling and, and, and this kind of stuff and thermal modeling on the core. And then um, I would say like chemical and process engineering. If you've worked in the oil and gas industry, if you've worked with Fisher Trop, we want to talk to you. Um, and uh, yeah, any, anyone who can, you know, machine really well and weld really well is, uh, is always going to be useful. And then uh, on the, and, and oh, the other one is uh, electrical engineers currently looking for, you know, extremely fast moving electrical engineers. So yeah, that's that's what we're looking for right now. So let's say that you're able to combine uh, your plan, the right team, and capital. You've already raised some money. I'm assuming that you'll have to raise a lot more. Um, yep. 
what is the end product better than? And what I mean by that is like, you know, the the ultimate, are you saving people money? Are you saving them time? Do you have a yeah. product that's 10x better? Like, how do you evaluate, okay, if we get everything right and actually build what we think we can build, how much better are you than alternatives? Yeah, um, quite frankly, the end product is, is cheaper jet fuel. Uh, it's cheaper jet fuel, cheaper methane, um, cheaper gas, cheaper diesel. And um, that is actually really, really sexy. Doesn't sound that sexy when I say it, but but no, it's very sexy. And the reason is there is a $5 trillion industry currently trying to provide cheaper energy by drilling, by moving oil around, by cracking into the right chains of hydrocarbons. Super fun industry, by the way. It's, it's really awesome. I love it. Um, but it can't get much cheaper than it is right now. And if we, if you want to go out and build like a massive, massive company today that makes a lot of money. If you can go and make cheaper jet fuel, you're sitting really pretty. Um, and that's what we want to do. After jet fuel, um, you know, there's a lot of, there's actually a massive chemical market too. And a lot of those chemicals are, I would say like the price is pretty well indexed on your price of heat. So like how cheap is your heat can affect the price of, of your chemical commodity pretty quickly. And so there's a lot of like really, really fun things we get to tackle down the road, which is like, you know, how, you know, how cheaply can we make, uh, you know, the, the plastic feedstocks, how, how cheaply can we make polyethylene? How, how cheaply can we make, uh, you know, ammonia, these, these sorts of things, if we get the cheapest heat in the world. So that's what we're working on. When you are talking to other people in the industry, whether you're recruiting them, potential competitors or potential partners, what are they most impressed with given the progress to date? People on the outside who may not understand the industry really well, they would look and say, oh, you raised some money. Sounds like a really you know, ambitious idea. But what are the things that insiders are really impressed with? Today's episode is brought to you by Espresso, the maker of the world's thinnest portable display. Now listen up. If you're like me, you feel like you are at a command center when you sit down at your desk. I got a gazillion tabs open and different windows for different activities. There's my web browser, my text messages, I have Slack open, and I got a notes app. I normally work on a desktop and it can be very, very productive, but everything falls apart the second I leave my desk. If I'm traveling, if I go to a coffee shop to do some work or just want to work from the kitchen table, my laptop doesn't have enough screen space. I lose my command center and my productivity falls off a cliff. It's a major problem, but this is where Espresso comes in. They have a portable screen that is so beautiful that you think Steve Jobs came back from the dead to create it. The thing is incredibly light. It comes with a nice stand and the user interface is so easy that I figured out how to do it in less than three minutes. If you listen to this podcast, you know that's not an easy feat. So the Espresso team and I, we became friends. I got to know them because I really like the product and those screens, they now want to offer them to any fan of the podcast. So we struck a little deal. Here's how it works. Anyone who listens to this podcast can go to us.espres.so or that's too confusing just go click the link in the description if you go to espresso's website they've got a brand new offer there sitting for you you get a little discount and you'll get a beautiful screen trust me i use mine every day you'll love the espresso screen and i think it'll make you more productive go check them out today by clicking on the link in the description yeah i think the thing that's that's sort of most surprising to the insiders off the bat is, is like I said before, this sort of um, really, really counterintuitive uh, market shift. So I, I think that everything about companies are determined by who's the customer and what's the product. And there are a lot of things that's, that's actually kind of counterintuitive, but this is how technology works. Technology kind of forms itself and shifts itself to a certain customer in a certain market. So like PCs are the ways that they are because they're serving business customers. Macs are the way they are because they're serving creatives. And technology sort of morph themselves and shift themselves. And it's not just the shape of the technology. It's the shape of the companies that service that, you know, that industry. So like uh, SpaceX, it's a very different company than, uh, you know, any of the subcontractors that we're putting together, you know, the rockets for NASA. Um, and uh, I, so I think the thing that's, that's like, really, really interesting right now is that we have figured out a model here where we can actually do mass scale nuclear and the market's right and the incentives are right. And uh, we just have to do really, really hardcore engineering together. Um, but that's really, really fun because it, for a long time, it doesn't, it hasn't really mattered how hardcore your engineering is. Like you can get super, super cracked hardcore engineers in a room and you can create an incredible design for a nuclear reactor and then not sell it to anyone. Cause like no one's buying nuclear reactors. 
So we've got a model here that actually allows us to do incredible engineering and seriously make money at the end of the day. How much money can you make? When we are, so I, I, I'll, I'll describe it as like a curve. Um, what we want to get to is where we are on the style of curve where we are reinvesting uh, profits on selling hydrocarbons into uh, sort of increasing scale of sites and, and decreasing cost of replication on our units. So we, we want to have very, very large sites where we're making jet fuel and uh, we want to be sort of turning those on in a rolling fashion, selling the fuel. And then we have this rolling process of reinvesting the profits from selling those hydrocarbons into bigger factories, bigger units, more verticalization. Um, and uh, like this is, a, this is the type of thing where if that, that could take us, you know, 10 years uh, to get to the point where, where that's where our cash is coming from, that reinvestment. And then another 10 years after that, like, look, we could be making hundreds of billions of dollars of free cash flow. And do you just stay with the jet fuel? Or are there other things that you can do? A lot of these processes uh, and kind of industrial manufacturing uh, you know, businesses, what I've learned over the years is like there's all kinds of waste and byproducts and other things yeah. you can monetize and you know, get creative. How do you think about, okay, we're going to go build cheaper jet fuel. We're going to do it in this yeah. really kind of unpopular way. What are the expansion opportunities from there once you've kind of earned the right by focusing on the first thing? Yeah, so – Jet fuel is is like a really good hydrocarbon to make because it is in like serious, serious demand. It's going to stay in serious demand. There's high volume for it. It's easy to transport. Uh, but there are a variety of other hydrocarbons for other purposes. I think the thing that, you know, there's a whole spectrum of, of hydrocarbons we can make and sell depending on where we're located, like methane for uh, for use in, in that gas turbines. Like th this is how most countries make their electricity is, you know, pipelines of of nat gas. Um, and uh, so that's exciting. But beyond that, like the chemical market, man, is, a, is super interesting to me. I, I love I love the, the chemicals industry. It's a $5 trillion industry that nobody really thinks about that much. And, um, you know, part of my thesis is that there's a massive portion of those chemicals that can be made cheaper, like I said, if you have cheap heat. Um, so like fundamentally, we're, we're a cheap heat company and we figure out how to sell like mass scale cheap heat to the commodity market. Now, as I see this being built, um, the h manufacturing itself seems like uh, it's going to be something you have to figure out theoretically, and then you have to go actually do. Um, how much dependent are you on international supply chains? How like American or domestic uh, oriented is it? And do you see that as a plus or a minus? Like you know. Depending on how much dependency you have on other areas of the world, uh, certain inputs to that manufacturing process can determine whether you really control your own destiny or you see yeah. risk there as well. So I think that one of the things that Tesla kind of proved for everyone is that the whole question of like international dependency is more an issue for like horizontally structured companies than it is for vertically structured companies. And what I mean by that is like, well, while all other automakers were having serious supply chain issues, Tesla for the most part wasn't. And it's because if you actually kind of do the work, the deep verticalization work, and you design your product around verticalization, you design your, your manufacturing process around that, um, there are way fewer dependency points. You're still always going to have a few dependency points. Like, you know, Tesla had to figure out these presses and this kind of stuff, but, but you get to reduce the surface area of that a lot. What it means is you have to in-house a lot more engineering. And um, in order to in-house a lot of engineering, you have to have a massive terminal market. Like Tesla was able to do that because they're like, you know, we want to be the largest automaker. And that's a real, that's going to be a really big company, right? So, so they had the justification to do that. A lot of, you know, companies working on hard things maybe just don't have a big enough terminal market to justify in-housing this, you know, stainless press system, right? Um, for Valor, like, yeah, we're highly focused on verticalizing everything. And in fact, we're willing to trade off some efficiency. We're willing to trade off um, a lot of things for being able to control our destiny. And that's, that's for two reasons. One, you know, not, not being dependent on others, but really it's speed. Like we want to, we want to iterate really, really fast. And that means we're going to spend a little bit more on verticalizing for sure. 
And what exactly, like, give me some examples maybe of how, how you think of implementing that. Cause it, it theoretically sounds awesome. Right. And I think the yeah. point about Tesla uh, makes a ton of sense, but for you all specifically, like, what does that mean? The way that people perceive the nuclear industry is wrong. There are, there aren't very many, if at all, like nuclear reactor companies. There are components companies that make components for nuclear reactors. And then there are integrators that, you know, sub out designs and, you know, rough parameters and then get those parts in those components and then integrate them. So there's like, there are purchasers, integrators, and then suppliers. There are very, very few companies in the world who are like, yeah, we make nuclear reactors and we own like all of that process. So even just like the most, you know, fundamental parts of that, which is like, can you make your own core? Uh, can you make your own control rod drives? Uh, again, like you're going to buy down some stuff that, that's going to take a little bit longer and you're going to have to hire some really talented people who have thought through these problems before. But for us, like it's, it's worth doing. It's worth doing because at the end of the day, you know, if we can get that machine to work, there's a massive market on the other end. And when you're doing this, do you have to do it in one manufacturing facility? Like, is it just like build one massive plant, kind of like gigafactory equivalent, and you just have one of them? Or is the idea basically you build them all over the world and it's all about cutting down transportation time? Um, you know, how, how do you kind of think of like, okay, we're successful. There are these other components about geography, uh, uh, site selection. There is regulation of the country that you go into. There is yep. the cost and speed of transportation of the quote unquote cheaper jet fuel. Uh, now with things like the Houthis and, and kind of global supply chains, you, you kind of get an, a new chess piece on the board. So how are you thinking about that today? Yeah. So like spiritually, it's much, it's going to be much clo closer to the gigafactory type layout. And um, again, like we're kind of coming out of this era where it made a lot of sense, but it didn't make sense, but it made temporary sense to like fracture everything. Um, we saw like really, really cheap suppliers be able to pop up because there was like some temporary, it, it, let, let's say you have a, a process and you have labor running that process. And then China's like, look, we copy pasted that process, but our labor costs 20% of the, you know, of that price. And so, you know, we just shaved, you know, let's say 30% off your, off of your total in the short term. It's like, oh, wow, let's go horizontalize everything and we'll just be an integrator. And at the end of the day, we can make all the stuff for like 20 to 30% cheaper. We can dominate the market, right? So that, that's the era that we're currently coming out of. Um, the thing that that model misses is innovation. It misses that, okay, sure, China figured out how to copy paste your process with cheaper labor. But what you're missing is that like a little bit of R&D spend and a little bit of creativity could have gotten you a 50% cheaper process. Right. Um, and, and so that's where we want to have a much closer, tighter model where it's really, really smart people thinking about innovating the entire process and pushing those costs down. And so, yeah, like, could it, could it be cheaper to sort of like run this like regulatory play where you're doing different regions and trying to integrate things together? That is short term thinking. Um, we want to push these cost curves down over and over and over for decades. And when you talk to investors, what is their uh, excitement, right? And I'm assuming the mission is a big one. Um, yeah. But what, what are they excited about? And then what are they scared of? Why, why do you not have, you know, $5 billion in the company's bank account right now? Because every investor is clamoring over you to, uh, to, to give money for this crazy idea. Yeah. Um, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. Um, I think that the initial uh, hesitation, I, I'll say like when, when we were going and raising, the initial hesitation people had uh, was just, we don't know how to underwrite all of these technical areas at once, right? There's a, there's several different, you know, areas of, of, uh, you know, complex engineering that we need to do and we need to put it all together. And um, most firms, you know, do not, at least at the small scale, don't have those three experts sitting in the room at any one time. And so I think that's probably something that uh, is going to, not be as much of an issue once we actually have the expertise in house and can show them like, yeah, we're, we're making hydrogen over here. We're making jet fuel, you know, here's our, our core that's coming online. Um, and then, yeah. So, but then on the excitement side, like it actually is really, really exciting to be part of energy and to have a new fundamental play with energy and nuclear has always been that like sort of dark horse. It's always been this like 
what if we could just make energy way cheaper? Because the economics of it are crazy, right? Like people don't realize that the economics are insane. A dollar of uranium turns into like $48,000 of electricity. Like the, the gap there is enormous. And so it's this, this dark horse that's always kind of on the, on the horizon, but it just has the wrong market until Valor. Like all the other companies trying to pursue that, I just think they have the wrong market. Um, electricity is, is a terrible product at the end of the day. So I think the thing that's really exciting is like, we get to actually ride that dark horse into the city, um, but we're going to ride it on the back of hydrocarbons, not electricity. And there is very compelling evidence that the more energy a society consumes, the more prosperous it becomes. Yeah. If you drop the cost of uh, some of that energy, obviously people will consume more of it. Um, how much more prosperous can we get? I think this. I think the future is very, very exciting. Um, I'm. Uh, I'm definitely a techno optimist. I think that we're going to, you know, continue building this this technological machine that we all live in right now, and it's it's does not have a strict limit that I can perceive today. But uh, I think we're at an inflection point where there are a couple of pillars coming together. So the, the three pillars that I've identified, um, and honestly, I'm not sure if I invented this or not. I've tried Googling it to see if other people have been talking about this. And the, the only articles that come up are, are ones that I co-authored. So I'm not exactly sure. But um, the three pillars are, so all I have to say, if anybody came up with this and it wasn't me, please DM me so I know that. Uh, dexterity, energy, and intelligence are these three pillars. So dexterity being the ability to actually physically manipulate the world, right? You might have the right idea of how atoms and molecules should be shaped in your head, but can you actually enact that? Uh, energy is, you know, just obvious. It's a property of, of the universe. And then intelligence is, like we said, sort of the know-how on how to move things around, how to arrange them, how to construct them. So dexterity, uh, energy, and intelligence. In the agrarian era, everything was human. So dexterity was actual fingers. Uh, energy was the chemical energy in your biological system that you got from eating food, which originally came from the sun. And then intelligence was, of course, human intelligence. In the industrial age, uh, you know, starting in the, in the 1800s, we started to make machines a little bit dexterous, right? So, so we gave machines the ability to you know, move cotton in the right way to make clothing, and then eventually to sort of stamp out you know, cars and cars can now move around. And then intelligence was like a little bit embedded, but it was more just kind of mechanical constraint. Uh, and then energy shifted from like the biological energy of our bodies to energy latent in hydrocarbons in the crust. So mostly coal. Um, so we're getting into a new era now. So this is a grain age and the industrial age. I think that the next era gets really, really exciting, mostly because of the decreasing cost of intelligence. So we're starting to figure out how to like bake intelligence into things um, that's that's operating at a much higher level. We're also kind of figuring out dexterity more, although I think that was always not as big of a problem as intelligence was. And um, now the problem is that energy has been stagnating. So intelligence is going vertical, dexterity is going vertical, energy is stagnating. And so that's why Valor is working on this. I think in order for us to get into this future where you know, the cost of all material things are, are dropping significantly. And, you know, we're able to terraform the earth to, to make it more pleasant to live in and to create more dry land for people to live on and get into space and, you know, be creating space ha habitations and terraform other planets. Um, we've got the intelligence, you know, trending toward that direction. We've got the dexterity trending toward that direction. But energy is that is the short stick right now. Uh, and so that's why that's what I'm working on. And I guess one of my last questions for you is just, you all are successful. Uh, you get all these smart people. You get all this capital. You're able to create cheaper jet fuel. Is there a world where the machines consuming the fuel actually have to adapt to the cheaper jet fuel? Whether that is uh, the companies and, and they change you know cost structures and, and kind of the financing mechanisms and things like that, or maybe actually the fuel has an advantage or, or maybe a disadvantage. You know, there's some difference in the fuel that changes the uh, the structures as well, and it kind of feels like those are the second or third order effects that, if successful, either new problems could spawn or new improvements that are built on top of cheaper jet fuel that previously weren't possible, similar to what we've seen with SpaceX having cheaper you know, launch, then there's a bunch of new use cases that get unlocked as well. 
Yeah, no, I mean, look, I think like increasing or stagnant energy costs is a sickness. Like I think it's a societal sickness and um, we're trying to cure it. So I think my simple answer to that is like a lot of things get better overnight really, really quickly. Just for instance, why, why are cars ugly now? Why are all cars ugly? Like, I think it's because fuel costs too much. Why are, it seems like a lot of the electric cars coming out now actually kind of look better than uh, some of the gas cars. It's because they have different constraints on the shape of those things based on, you know, their, their fuel consumption. If you look at like cars pre-1975, there's real artistry and beauty built into these things. And then after that, they became sort of like, you know, mechanistic functions of fuel consumption. And um, why do dishwashers suck at washing dishes? Well, it's because they are being tuned for energy efficiency, not, you know, function of dishwashing. There's a lot of things in our society that are like built around the price of energy, either stagnating or getting higher, that I think once we can fix that, once it's really, really cheap to put methane into a, into a pipe and create electricity, it's really, really cheap to move, you know, jet fuel, you know, to, to another country and, and, uh, and run your jets. Like there's a lot of things that, that suddenly get solved we're not even thinking about right now. The last topic, uh, it's very intertwined. El Segundo, the Gundo, uh, also EAC feels like yes. maybe Gundo is uh, the home base, HQ. Maybe actually uh, it is the heaven that you ascend to in EAC once you have finally <laughs> uh, adhered to the religion. T- talk to you about both of those and, and kind of how they reinforce each other and why you think they're so important. Yeah. Yeah. So Gundo is a. Uh, Obviously, we're, we're right here in El Segundo, Valor HQ. I moved here uh, late last year, and it, it's a fantastic moment that we're having. And I think it's going to grow into just a lot of incredible companies and dense talent. I think that, you know, I moved here. I, I decided to, to set up the company here because I really fell in love with the place. And I, I fell in love with the talent base. It's just incredibly, incredibly talented and smart people that have been working here for a long time. They're also deeply patriotic, which is, which is super important to me. I think both this like Gundo and EAC thing uh, have this note of, you know, pride and joy in your own, you know, people and your nation and in moving that people and that nation forward through time technologically and even in terms of things like, you know, having more kids and that kind of stuff. There's this deeply like societally optimistic uh, thing that we're doing here. Um, yeah. So... I, I think you're right. This is, uh, it, it's, I'll call it HQ. Uh, and uh, maybe we can call Mars the heaven that you ascend to in this, uh, in EAC. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Where can we send people to find you on the internet or find out more about uh, Valor Atomics? Yeah. So valoratomics.com, uh, if you are any of the types of engineers that I spoke of, or even if you're just a super talented engineer and you want to submit your resume anyway, you can do it there. You can also find me on x.com. Uh, search for Isaiah Taylor, Valor Atomics. So yeah, that's where you can find me. And uh, is there any one last message you want to leave with people if they come and they work at the company? What, what, what's going to happen? I mean, if I could leave a message with everyone, it's just consume more energy and and have more kids. Uh, having kids is wonderful. There should be a trillion humans and we should be using the power of 1500 stars. And guess what? Energy is free. Like fundamentally in the universe, energy is free. More humans are better. Uh, let's get out of this decel mind decel mindset and start building again.